Welcome back to Media Apocalypse, our series about the threats that are facing journalism, news gathering, and the flow of information on matters of public concern in our democracy. In this show, we explore solutions, both legal and practical, for preserving the press function. I am delighted to have an old friend on the show today, Yachai Benkler, whose official title is the Jack N. and Lillian R. Berkman Professor for Entrepreneurial Legal Studies. Uh, he is sometimes better known as the co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And for others, he's even better known as the author of The Wealth of Networks from 2006 and a series of really interesting studies on propaganda and disinformation. Welcome to the show, Yochai. Great to be with you, Jack. Uh, I want to first talk about this report that just came out in October about mail-in voting. As I understand this report, you are tracing the major sources of disinformation about uh, mail-in voting, whether it's likely to produce voter fraud, uh, whether it's likely to cause all sorts of problems. And of course, all of this has been debunked, but it doesn't prevent the stuff from circulating. And as I understand it, the main conclusion of this report, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to spread disinformation myself, <laughs> is that the central source, the central distributor of uh, of this kind of disinformation is not social media so much, although it's involved. Rather, it's one, the president of the United States, uh, who's a central media actor, and two, uh, what we might call legacy media, cable television, Fox News, talk radio, uh, and other legacy elements of the conservative media ecology. Is that correct? Yeah, that's basically right. Um, what I've been doing with my team for the last five years or so is developing a sweep of uh, tools and platforms that allow us to collect uh, stories that are published on the open web, uh, tweets, uh, Facebook shares, uh, and also use other people's platforms to also look to some extent less extent at TV, the, the primarily the 24 hour networks, to try to provide a much broader and richer, but still heavily quantitative understanding of the media ecosystem as it relates to the election. And we did it on the election of 2016, on the, on the first year of the Trump presidency, that all came out in 2018 in network propaganda in the book, and now this new. So what we did was we took uh, about 55,000 stories published between March and the end of August, um, um, 75,000 public Facebook posts, 5 million tweets, and just analyzed when did they peak? When didn't they peak? Um, what? And then we could zoom in both quantitative and quantitatively on each peak and say, okay, who started this? Did this come from Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk network of paid bots? Did this start from some accounts that we know have been associated with various Russian campaigns like the White Helmets? Or, mm -hmm. And for each one of them, we were able to identify the starting point. And the starting point overwhelmingly is Donald Trump. Now, again, it's not Donald Trump on social media, even though many of these are on his Twitter account. Because he's president of the United States, he uses Twitter the way he could use press releases. And in fact, we found that his interviews by phone on Fox News, on, on Maria Bartiromo, on Fox Business, on Fox and Friends, on Hannity's radio show, as well as his daily coronavirus um, um, press briefings, where he's directly talking to the press, these are the transition points. And so a few hours later, sometimes a few seconds later, somebody starts to circulate them on Twitter. But again, the inflection points, the major proponents would be his communications uh, staff on the campaign, um, uh, his communications staff at the White House, uh, the RNC, various leading Republicans. That's what's, ha what's happening is essentially a top driven statement taken by mass media outlets, both on the right and in the mainstream, as news, because the president just said it, put in the headline as headline, because what the president just said is norms breaking, man bites dog quality, and then uh, uh, disseminated throughout 
uh, the population. And because we could look comprehensively at the entire record, I can say with some confidence empirically that in this case, social media was secondary and much more traditional elite driven mass media model of propaganda, it describes the core of what's happening. Now, I want to, I want to bore down on the, the theory of it for a second uh, before we talk about some of the, the practices. So uh, one way people have imagined how disinformation and propaganda work is that um, Russian agents or some other folks infiltrate the far edges of the social media network. And somehow it spreads like a virus uh, through different parts till it finally reaches the center. Now, uh, and your point is, no, that's not how it's going on. There's the center with uh, very important people who are uh, widely uh, listened to, widely watched, widely read. They're amplified by other institutions, longstanding institutions that are also widely read and widely paid attention to. And it disseminates then into social media and then into the interstices of, of the internet. That makes perfect sense to me, but it, it also suggests something very interesting about the ecology of the internet. It's related to work you did earlier in your career. So if, if, we, if we stop thinking about Trump's, uh, the president and think of him as a node, and if we stop thinking about NBC, CBS, and ABC as network, as a, a, a legacy media and thinking about nodes, these are probably the most connected nodes of communication in the media ecology, even though they're not on the internet. That is to say, more people will probably hear what Trump says, and each hearing is a kind of connection. It's a network connection, although it's not through the internet. Same thing is true with the mainstream media. They're not necessarily on the internet, or rather people's access to them isn't necessarily through the internet. But nevertheless, every time you communicate with someone, that's a network. That's a, a kind of network. It's just not a electronic network of the internet type. So what we know from network theory is very simple. The nodes that have the most connections probably have the greatest power to spread whatever message they want to spread. And we were deceived in some ways by imagining that the way to understand which nodes were most powerful was to focus on internet connections. When in fact, what we should have been paying connection, uh, uh, attention to is just communication connections through whatever medium is used. Now, to what extent does your research show that? Or have I misunderstood what you're saying? So, uh, how many hours do you have? Uh, a few minutes. Can you sum it up in 30 seconds? <laughs> um, I walk up and down the stairs. It takes longer than an elevator pitch. Um, <clears throat> so, it's really important not to confound uh, network analysis in the technical analytic sense, where you could describe anything from family connections, connections right. in, in uh, um, uh, early societies, and technical networks. And, That's what my uh, point. That's precisely uh, my point. I, I understand. But um, uh, so once upon a time, we used to call it network TV. Uh, and uh, but the point of the network was actually not identifying the network. So let's separate things out. Could you describe the entire media ecosystem as a network in which you have end users, readers, listeners, viewers, media producers, large and small, as a two mode network? You'd also need different kinds of links or edges where only viewership is one kind of edge versus actual citation versus something else. So we do this a lot. We use web links as a proxy for influence among media producers. We use tweets and Facebook shares on Facebook media as a proxy for demand side. We don't have good data on individual viewers, which you would need. So there's a conceptually, you could in theory call them, in fact, not could, you, you ought in principle to uh, treat the media ecosystem as a whole, uh, as a single network. Uh, we do that in this report, for example, one of the ways in which we try to do that is by looking at the subset of syndicated stories, 
and using network analysis from what we do have just by text similarity to identify networks that would systematically be undercounted by traditional methods because you don't think of AP as all of the readers of all of the newspapers and all of the local TV channels. And we tried to highlight that, but there's a real measurement shortfall. When we move from just, can we wave our arms and say, theoretically, this is a network to, can we measure it and say something about how it functions? And that's, so, so yes, you can, but I think it's important to be very crisp about what you're talking about. If you're talking about the total media ecosystem, and that's why we've moved to talking about media ecosystems, then yes, your description is exactly the right description. We have a bimodal network of viewers or readers or listeners and media outlets. Within the media outlets, we have those that are online, those that are TV, those that are radio, those that are both, uh, uh, on both. In a universe in which you really wanted to capture everything, you'd have churches, you'd have people hanging out with their friends, you have email. There was a beautiful paper just uh, came out a couple of days ago um, uh, uh, by Andy Guess at, at, at all that 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 looked at um, COVID communication, and they found that the most the most common um, uh, predecessor to a, 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 a false a false site or, or a vaccine hesitant site was using an email application. Mm -hmm. You just get the little bit that that's where actually people are. So yes, of course you need it all. It's just extremely difficult. And balancing between completeness of the view and precision of the measurement techniques so that you can be confident empirically about what you're saying is what's so difficult. That's I right. think what's I just, unusual about our work yeah. is that we actually look at ways of trying to combine all of these, whereas almost right. all the work today will look just at Facebook or just at Twitter. But uh, the reason I, I ascended to this level of generality because there's a general a point that might be missed from your uh, your uh, studies, which I hope you think is correct. The more connected you are, the more powerful you are as a disseminator of propaganda, and the less connected you are, all other things being equal, the less likely, probability-wise, you're going to be the main source of propaganda and disinformation. That is, it's not surprising that Trump. In hindsight, it's not surprising that Trump is the main disseminator of propaganda. If you imagined a little Trump on the edge of the network, hardly likely that he would be as effective as the Trump we have in the middle of the network. So a couple of different things on that. First of all, uh, it really depends on your prominence within the relevant target audience. So if your relevant target audience is a bunch of right-wing domestic terrorists, uh, being prominent in the sub-networks that they attend to makes you vastly more influential than the fake news media of NBC. So mm -hmm. it really matters what the particular audience is and what the threat model you're trying to redress is. Uh, the second is not to put down too much the theory that once upon a time I used to be closely associated with uh, 15 years ago, which is the whole point of the network public sphere was that we had an inversion of that model that you've just described by which people on the periphery, none of whom had high connectivity, could attend to each other's work, emphasize its importance, and then force it onto the agenda of the highly connected nodes so that it was about the effect of cooperation and collaboration on pushing things up. And before we ignore that, I think it's completely impossible to understand the transformation of the debate in America about police killings of black men and women, except through the, the prism of what happens when you have a population with video cameras in their hands everywhere forcing around the gatekeeping a transformation of the debate. Now, that's not a peripheral issue. That's a classic network public sphere model of forcing onto the agenda without understating the importance of the actual physical protest on the street. It's not uh, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, Arab Spring on Facebook. It's a combination. But that's a model that really was quite the opposite of what we're seeing here. So I wouldn't want to just say none of that actually happened. Well, no, in fact, I want to say that both of these tech, uh, both of these forms of influence are occurring and that what your current work is doing is showing that the uh, 
that the uh, another model, the model, the top-down model, the model of the highly connected node having a disproportionate influence is still with us. Absolutely. And that it's that it's been weaponized by uh, various actors in American society. Do we have any evidence that the same effects are going on any place else in the world? That is, do you have, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Do we have evidence that that the second model, the second model that you're working with today <clears throat> is what's going on in other parts of the world? That is to say that disinformation and propaganda are being weaponized by, if you will, the most connected nodes uh, and then spread out generally, as opposed to the first model, which is the model of the folks at the edge, lots of people at the edge combining and cooperating to send and drive information into the center of the network public sphere. So uh, uh, we move here from things that I know about from my direct research as an empirical researcher to things that I read as materials from other people's work. Um, and, and in that regard, I have no particular privileged position. Um, I think it's very hard to read uh, about what uh, Russian uh, 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 clamp down on media and control and ownership, what uh, Orban in Hungary, what Erdogan in Turkey is doing. Modi is an interesting uh, uh, move in, in uh, India because it is, uh, it is from the center, but it uses very heavily WhatsApp and, and, and distributed media, but it is very centralized uh, in its model with very large scale dissemination of centralized produced WhatsApp systems. Well, so I think we're seeing it all over the, the question world. in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm thinking about the comparative angle, but the question is, is that one of the big findings, or at least to me, one of the big findings of his, your book, Network Propaganda, is that in the United States, you have a, a center to left sort of media ecosystem, which has most of the mainstream publications and a lot, a lot of the public connected to it. And then there's this uh, off to the side somewhere, there's a sort of uh, high, uh, more concentrated uh, conservative right wing media ecosystem, which has uh, more concentrated, but it has connections to the mainstream one. And the, the curious puzzles of American media policy and, and a lot of the uh, um, things we've seen in American media come from the interaction between this larger connected mainstream media ecosystem and this smaller, more densely packed uh, right-wing uh, media ecosystem. So that when we think about policy interventions, we have to keep that fact in mind. It's not a single uniform media ecosystem. It's one that's differentiated in really interesting ways. The question I was interested in is, do we have any evidence that the same kind of a strange distribution, which we have in the United States, is present in other countries? So that's a great question. Um, two teams of colleagues, um, uh, one at Sciences Po, the other who was a fellow um, um, uh, with us, uh, have done, uh, he used the same techniques to analyze the French and German public spheres. And it's quite clear that neither of those countries has the same structure that we do. Everyone more or less um, 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 attends to the um, um, apex mass media. Uh, there is a small group on the right in Germany, a slight, uh, in, in France, a slightly bigger one, very heavily anchored on the IFD uh, on, on, on the far right um, uh, in Germany. But there's broad population attention to the mainstream. So you don't have the same uh, insularity. And, and asymmetric polarization that you have. There's, there's more of a, in France in particular, they were able to show a little bit more of a, there's um, establishment, anti-establishment across the right and the left rather than anything else, but still overwhelmingly attention to traditional mainstream media. Uh, I don't have anyone who's done this research on England, on, on the UK yet. Uh, uh, if there's a place where I could imagine that the, daily tabloids would produce such an equivalent uh, um, uh, system. It would be uh, there, I think, between Republic TV and WhatsApp. It's possible that it's there in India. But again, I don't have good measurement. And particularly because WhatsApp is so big, it's extremely difficult to study. So uh, if you look at 
uh, some of the things that the Reuters Institute is coming out in terms of patterns of trust in media, then you know that um, uh, Hungary and Israel are the only two other countries among the countries that they look at that have a similar structure where the supporters of the governing coalition distrust media more than supporters of the opponents of the governing coalition. And that may be a tell that what you're getting there is something like that, where there's official yeah. state supporting media and a majority of the population that's being more constrained. So, so these are initially, but one thing is for sure in response. There is no single thing that comes out of the technology. What you get is an interaction of the technology with the political economy and political culture of the country with its political institutions. And unsurprisingly, you're gonna get variation and there's no single solution. Even if everybody's using the same technical platforms, there's no single answer to this. Right, and one of the important takeaways of network propaganda, at least for me, was that these tendencies in American media had a little bit a long time coming and that the internet basically mapped onto them and, and uh, stretched them, amplified them, whatever metaphor you wanna use. But if you want to understand the sources of our media discontents in America, you really have to go back several decades. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a chapter there. I just came out with a slightly uh, uh, refined version of it in a chapter in an edited volume. The, you have to start with the new coalition that formed a new political identity around between 1968 and 1980, which is the people who rejected the women's movement and the individual rights movement exclusion of religion, that is to say, the newly politicized evangelical uh, 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 Christian fundamentalists, the white identity voters that LBJ knew he was going to lose when he supported civil rights legislation, and that Nixon immediately turned around to harness with the Southern strategy and the war on drugs, and then Reagan with Welfare Queen, Bush with Willie Horton, et cetera, uh, anchored. So you had this new coalition that really didn't have outlets. So televangelist, Pat Robertson starts to introduce news in 1980. By 86, he's the third most watched, Christian Broadcast Network is the third most watched uh, uh, cable network. Uh, 1988, without the Fairness Doctrine, Rush Limbaugh gets uh, syndicated coast to coast. 1996, Fox get, gets created. The deregulation of, of group ownership allows Clear Channel to become coast to coast, morning to night, talk radio provider uh, and syndicator. And so essentially what you have is by the time Breitbart comes along in 2007, right-wing audiences have already proven themselves to be an extremely lucrative and relatively homogeneous market segment where homogeneous means alienated equally from the more mainstream. And so they became an incredibly lucrative market segment that Fox News builds on and they feed back on themselves. And that's really what creates the propaganda feedback loop. By 2007, when Breitbart comes along, there is simply no option to enter into that market except by taking on the Limbaugh Hannity model of stoking outrage and reinforcing identity, irrespective of its relationship to the truth. And politicians or media outlets that try to do otherwise get shut down either in primaries if they're politicians or in ratings if they're media outlets. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Yochai. Ronel? Hey there. Um Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Um, I've, I have an observation to make uh, just about uh, the sort of way that your work maps onto some of the landscape of the other folks that we've been talking with. And then I want to uh, sort of use that observation as a leaping off point for a couple of questions about the legacy media and your views on them. Um, the observation is that we've had lots of folks uh, here uh, to have conversations with us <clears throat> who have really been thinking about uh, the sort of interrelationships between the uh, legacy mainstream media, um, social media, and news. Uh, and, and you're adding something uh, slightly different to that, uh, the sort of relationship between uh, legacy media, social media, and disinformation. Uh, but the, um, the sort of synapses and uh, pieces of connectivity are really similar. In, that, um, in, the, in the previous space, a lot of folks have been sort of pointing us to this 
disconnect between legacy media being engaged in like reportage and social media being engaged in repeatage, the sort of passing along of stuff that they themselves didn't generate. And in, in the earlier conversations, um, that's a source of serious concern about you know, the ongoing vitality of the news gathering function and um, you know, ad dollars flowing and, and attention flowing um, in directions that don't sustain some of the critical press functions that we need in a democracy. Uh, your observations um, are uh, really interesting to map onto that, right? Because they're helping us see that um, uh, all of the good that legacy media is doing um, uh, is a, a source of concern for those folks, but all of the bad that legacy media is doing is also a source of concern. And it seems like either way, a real focus on um, what we uh, think of as sort of old style legacy media may still be really, really important. Um, in that space, I want to ask you two questions that are sort of related to that press function um, and the performance of it. Um, we've been talking with others about how to cover disinformation without lending credence uh, to disinformation or, or sort of worse yet, becoming a, a purveyor of it. Um, the sort of dangers of both siding and false equivalence reporting, especially um, sort of rooted in the sense that everything the president says and does um, is newsworthy. And we've heard some um, sort of starkly competing views on, um, you know, objectivity in journalism. Um, uh, Jay Rosen and Ben Smith um, uh, sort of differing views about, for example, the coverage of when a public official lies. Um, I'm just wondering if you can tell us from your unique lens, uh, kind of based on your empirical analyses of amplification and spread of disinformation, um, what do you think the kind of short list of best practices should be in that space? So this is a great question. I, I just want one little contribution to make. I would retire the term legacy media. Uh, it's, it's, um, it implies a certain transition from mass media to social media as the norm. And, you know, it's, 30 years later, 25 years later, we haven't seen that transition. We saw a period of loss of direction, of confusion, but then we're seeing it back again. So I, I don't think, I think mass media and social media, mass media and distributed media, these are good terms. Uh, I, would, I would start by retiring legacy media on the assumption that there's some secular trend away from it. it close parentheses. Um, we first encountered this part, the, 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 so I came completely innocent to this question because when our first studies on um, uh, controversies like SOPA PIPA, um, um, intellectual property regulation, net neutrality, all supported the idea that the network public sphere in fact operated the way I think it did 15 years ago, which is to say, marginal media, mobilized uh, activists, etc., succeeded in forcing the mainstream to change its agenda. What happened when we moved to start to look at the elections was that the amount of attention and the amount of production that was going into this system was a completely different scale. We had to scale up our abilities times 10, 15, 20 to even be able to comprehend what was going on. And it's in that context, in the national elections context, that we can be confident that what's happening is mass media leads, but it's not true in all cases for, or for all issues. So what was the problem there? When we looked at what the top 50 mass media produced, it was very clear throughout the period. If it was Clinton, it was about scandals. It was emails, it was foundation, it was Benghazi. If it was, <clears throat> if it was Trump, it was issues, immigration, jobs, trade. Now, as, Ta as Tom Patterson showed in qualitative analysis, uh, all the coverage was negative, but because the editors of the major media outlets opposed Trump on the substance, they could be negative on the substance. In order to balance that, they had to be negative on Clinton and there they just gave free flow to um, uh, the negative, uh, to, to the scandal stuff. And we show there by looking one at another, the scandal stuff was very much manufactured propaganda coming very heavily out of Bannon with the government accountability initiative, et cetera. The same pipeline that produced Hunter Biden and Bursima produced Clinton Foundation. The only difference we see in our work is how the mainstream is responding to it. So that's what brings me back to your question. 
because what we saw when we looked at January, February, when they tried to reboot Hunter Biden in January uh, against Biden, when it began to look like he was a more serious candidate. What happened again with the New York Post uh, uh, piece of, of propaganda uh, last week uh, was that mainstream media was no longer, became more aware and Ben Smith's piece from the Times from last week actually captures this quite well. In 2016, professional media basically thought they had lost the game. They were legacy media. They were trying to keep up. They basically needed to put big boards that told them what was most tweeted to understand what to write about and how to write about it. And that turned out to be false. It turns out they're still enormously powerful. And understanding that responsibility, rather than being dragged along uh, 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 to cover whatever will actually get you the bottom line uh, started to kick in. And so we have, look, there are some narrow things. We have good research from uh, disinformation campaigns that reporting on it using, uh, uh, using a, 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 a truth sandwich um, uh, is a useful device. You say, Yesterday, the president falsely said that this and this, it's false because blah, 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 blah. So you, you frame the statement as false up front. Now, there are journalists who worry that that's um, uh, not objective, that that exhibits partisanship. But the truth of the matter is, it's not objective to report equally on what is known to be a lie and what is known to be truth. That's not objectivity, that's fake balance. And nobody understood this as well as when the, the, balance of bi the, the bias of balance paper on reporting on climate change came out, when it became clear that people believed that there was science on both sides, largely because newspapers covered, always felt like they needed to, co to come up with a climate skeptic to counter any climate science. And by the time it was something like 98% to two in terms of climate change is um, uh, anthropogenic, in the newspapers, it was still 50-50, the positions. So that people understood and started to change practices. What happens, and this is distinct going back to the point that Jack was making earlier about what to do with an asymmetric system. When you're in the context of an asymmetric propaganda system, when one side of the divide operates in a propaganda feedback loop that only punishes those who are identity non-conforming, that is to say they are centrist, they have views that are based in science as opposed to based in right-wing identity. And on the other side, you see a reality check community as it were, where media sites police each other for going too far uh, uh, off the wall, um, being balanced necessarily amplifies the, uh, uh, the, the propagandist effort from the propagandist side. So I think it's professional and objective to slow yourself down, to anchor yourself in what are and aren't facts and to report according to that, rather than trying to present umpire by claiming that there's a both sides to the issue. That's super helpful. Um, I have a follow-up question that I think relates to that and that um, certainly loops back to some of the conversation you were having with Jack about um, the important work that you've done um, revealing that the American political um, media ecosystem is really asymmetrically um, polarized. Um, yeah, I appreciate that you've sort of described for us sort of the source of that asymmetry, sort of historically how that um, came about and, and how it um, remains true, um, the sort of forces that keep it remaining true. But can you just sort of follow up to describe for us what the consequences of that structure are? Um, and sort of, um, you know, who's left susceptible here? And I guess more importantly, you know, what, if anything, can be done about it? Uh, so who's susceptible? It's very hard to quantify the precise numbers. If you back out of how many people tell, say, an organization like Pew that their primary source of news is Fox News or talk radio, 
and you try to back that out of, and, and you try to cross-reference that with numbers of people who declare themselves to be Republican or lean Republican in similar surveys, um, it's probably on the order of 40 million people, give or take. On the order of 40% of Republican and lean Republican voters are the people who really live inside Fox, Limbaugh, Breitbart universe. They are unreachable. They want to believe these things. They present such a fantastic business opportunity because they actively don't care about what institutions outside of that ecosystem believe a state is true. They don't trust those media. They don't trust science. They don't trust government statistics and agencies. They believe themselves to be under attack from these institutions because their core values and identity and their core economic security have in fact been under attack by that major mainstream elite driven governance structure. So those people are lost. They're lost. There's no way to answer. It's, 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 there's the few scientific studies we have of trying to look at who uses fake news. It's very narrowly concentrated. It's mostly concentrated on people over 65 who, and more likely to be conservative. When you look at Russian trolls, it's again, people who already hold those positions who follow them. They're lost. There are two populations that really matter. One is the population of probably on the order of 30% of the population who just don't care that much about politics, who think a pox on all your houses, who want entertainment and Fox and, and the sports, and occasionally will turn to the uh, news. Those people get their news still from local TV, from network TV, from regional uh, uh, and local newspapers, from CNN. Getting those people right means exactly changing the practices of mass media to make sure they are responsible in response to the asymmetric propaganda system. And the last segment, probably another roughly 40 million Republican and lean Republicans who uh, do some Fox News and some CNN and some network media. And again, they are the primary actor are responsible professional journalists and editors trying to counter program what they see on Fox News. What's unusual about the position I've arrived at is that I think that Facebook and Twitter are largely secondary, if not tertiary in terms of what they can and can't do about this. That's super helpful. Thank you. I'm going to um, hand things off to Scott. Uh, hi, yeah, hi. Um, because uh, you were um, also a faculty member of Yale Law School, though not when I was, I'm, I feel like I'm licensed to ask you a mean question. Um, so here's the mean question. Okay. Um, so you, of course, wrote the great um, uh, manifesto of networked public sphere, uh, the wealth of networks, um, which is, you know, of course, the, the book um, uh, about the subject um, circa 2006. Can I ask you to reflect on it and say maybe what you got wrong? Um, or put it another way, what you would have written if you wrote it now? That's not a mean question at all. It's a generous question of understanding that somebody can grow and, and learn. Um, it's far from a mean question. A um, Couple of different things uh, to defend what I said then in part, or to clarify what I said then and then why I changed or what, what about what I've changed has changed. First, it's really important to emphasize that what I talked about then was a possibility space of how things could go, not a deterministic or even semi-deterministic claim about where it will go. This was about here's what can happen given the material conditions of information production in a network age with decentralized ownership over means of knowledge, information, and cultural production, and how that could be recombined in a way that would 
uh, circumvent or undermine the, the problems with a mass media model, particularly a mass media model that was controlled by money. Now, I also said that the incumbents would fight back and that they would be pushing back. And it turns out they have fought back. And some of the, uh, uh, I mean, here we are now with net neutrality, without open access, without net neutrality. Uh, uh, so, so part of the issue with very strong IP rights. So part of the issue is that the battle was joined and the fully distributed model uh, uh, lost some of those battles. So that's part of the issue. And part of it is just about power in that regard. The second is that um, I remember right after the Arab Spring, uh, uh, Nagla Rizk, uh, who's, a, 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 who's been a fellow at, 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 at Yale at the ISP and has, been, and has been close as part of the access to knowledge movement, came back to me and said, because she was doing an analysis of the of, of the post-revolution structure. And she said, you're, you're, <laughs> this doesn't, the findings we're finding don't fit your model. And my response was, okay, teach me closely so I can <laughs> learn. What do you do other than look at the world and try to adjust what you understand uh, to what the world is? And so sure, in 2006, when Fox News was barely a decade old and its effect was not yet measured, when, um, uh, Wikipedia was just becoming an acceptable source, much less the baseline source. When um, um, uh, the open source stack was genuinely the only way in which we got rid of the Microsoft monopoly and before the rise of Facebook and Google as new monopolists, before the emergence of the handheld that fundamentally transformed a system with open physical material uh, uh, and, and non-proprietary open source uh, uh, um, 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 platform to a uh, much more proprietary and controlled framework. Before all of that, it was at least a reasonable uh, prediction that this was a realistic path. I've been writing, scratching my head and, 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 and about this at least since uh, uh, Practical Anarchism in 2012, 13, when I tried to see why it was that we were still talking Wikipedia, et cetera. So now I'm stuck in between. Here's what my evidence showed me is that this mass media model is very far from legacy. It's very real. At the same time, you can't look at Black Lives Matter. You can't look at Me Too and not understand that something really different is happening from what was the case in the 1990s or 1980s in terms of the role of distributed media. So we have to have a more refined understanding of the interaction between these two modes of communication and shaping public agenda. And that's what I tried to do in network propaganda. Um, th so um, that's, uh, that's really helpful. And of course, um, you would give an honest, thoughtful answer as, as expected. I wanted to ask you about um, what a slightly different question, which we around to your call the magic wand question. So you have a magic wand and you can wave it and you'll get the best policy outcome. Like you, you can change any policy that you want with this wand. What's your, what, what, what do you think, what would you use your wand on? That is what policy would you change that would, in some sense, um, uh, enable a healthier media ecosystem? Um, uh, I would prioritize uh, getting the substantive relations in society into a more decent order over a media policy. That is to say, tell me how I get to a, multi, to a multiracial social democracy and we'll be okay in terms of the media platform. Uh, I'm sorry, just, I just interrupt you there, right? So like the, so, um, so a lot of people would say is like the media platforms are the ones that are per, 
in part preventing this by creating asymmetric polarization and making it impossible for you know the parties to work together but you're you you, you really want to see it as like the base the the economic base is the thing that's um uh wagging the media dog rather than back the other way around uh yes uh i think that i think that if you can realistically fix the electoral system to be more democratic and remove some of the counter democratic uh, mechanisms, not only the electoral college, but also the Senate, much less the filibuster. Uh, and you actually had a genuine progressive shift that made people less miserable, that made the majority of people more economically secure with a genuine sense of uh, uh, what their possibilities are and why their children would be better off, the, they would be a less fertile ground for uh, uh, right-wing manipulation. There's reasonable evidence to suggest that support for far right, but also in France for, for Mélenchon, uh, is closely tied to um, exposure to trade in China, to exposure to automation. So, so I'm not fully materialist, but it's very hard to look at the fact that you that you have a very large population across the developed world that has seen itself creating uh, uh, suffering more insecurity and becoming more available to manipulation. I don't want to understate the importance of identity confirmation and tie and, and understanding the ties between the material and the aesthetic or the identity uh, concern is, is important. But I think we have such a strong emphasis today on the community, communicative and expressive side of things and too much understate the, the material uh, um, uh, foundation of it, that that's where I would put my energy, even among people talking about communication. Okay, uh, fantastic. I'm gonna um, uh, turn it over to Sandy. Thank you, Yohai. Well, hi, Yohai, uh, I'm Sandy Barron, and I'm the non-scholar in this crowd, um, a lifelong media participant and media lawyer, um, and I've worked with the mass media for many, many decades, and I've seen some of the transition that the media has gone through. To a certain extent, I think the questions I had you just answered to Scott, but I'm going to try and play them out, perhaps in slightly different ways. Um, when, when we look at the newspaper industry um, and we see the enormous concentration, um, and not to mention the enormity of the hedge fund operations that now own so many, and, and as of the last couple of weeks, the reporting on the fact that, that there are organizations that are creating legitimately fake news um, in the newspaper space, um, including buying up local papers and treating them as paid advertising media for right-wing news propaganda. Um, and I'm gonna pair that rather than ask you to just respond on newspapers to broadcasting, which I spent a good part of my life in. And it struck me that in the 80s, as you no doubt no, um, there were enormous changes that began in the broadcast television news business. Um, it had to do with declining ratings, declining advertising, new owners that thought they should actually break even rather than make money, and if not make a profit, um, and deregulation. You, you, you mentioned that earlier about deregulating the broadcast industry. Um, which allowed enormous concentration, Clear Channel, Sinclair, um, and also the Fairness Doctrine. Um, I think those two things, as the two you mentioned, were, are very significant. So looking at these major mass media and the ones that in fact you point to as being in many ways so significant in the way a certain large segment of Americans 
get their information and form their opinions. Are there really, are there any structural changes, any policy changes, any regulatory changes um, that you think might make a difference? Well, thanks, Sandy, for that question. That's a, that's a deep and hard one. Um, I think it was Harold Innes about 70 years ago who wrote, um, uh, newspaper men are people who write on the back of advertisements. Uh, and it was not a compliment. <laughs> um, uh, if we in the United States uh, picked a path that is almost unique among major democracies of relying purely on market actors or nearly purely on market actors to produce what is fundamentally a, pub, a, a public good. Um, it's very clear in the 20s, right after the Red Scare, uh, that when uh, every other country adopts, uh, uh, and obviously the BBC model is the standard alternative model, um, whereas the US uh, under, under um, um, uh, uh, Hoover as Secretary of Commerce went in the direction of uh, privately owned broadcast. And obviously before that with newspapers. So we have this tremendous history of public subsidies of newspaper and, news and postal newspaper, what Paul Starr so heavily emphasized in the creation of the media. Uh, but then we pull back and have this almost laissez-faire view. Now in science, in basic science, we do not depend on markets to produce the basic science. In the arts, we don't depend purely on basic science. In academia and history and social science, we don't depend only on market basics. Now, there's a real tension between government funding of media and the watchdog function of the press. So you have to design it very carefully. The BBC and the idea that you have essentially a per unit tax that then is completely segregated from the government is one way of doing it. Some people might say the BBC is great in what it does. Other people might be critical. There's a long history of criticism, but the idea that at a time at which American financialization of American markets that has undermined the social orientation of all business enterprises, relying on a business ecosystem that itself depends on finance. You said yourself about the hedge funds, right? It's not that, it's not that if you have a business with genuine alternative bottom lines, a family owned New York Times, a foundation uh, owned uh, Guardian, a family owned historically at least Washington Post and now essentially is almost a, a public service uh, a unit uh, owned by a billion. It, everything we've seen that have been major successful media in the US have been meaningfully insulated from pure market signals. So the question then becomes how do we design a publicly supported system just like we do for science and for other academic production just like we do for weather data and census economic data, everything that we need fundamentally for our society to function as a core base knowledge good, we make sure we fund publicly in meaningful levels, except for news. Now, it's one thing to say that's what you would sit and design in 1920 for broadcast or in uh, 1800 for news. It's another thing to design that in the context of a system where one of the two major parties is fundamentally committed to disabling an independent press, to disabling an independent civil service, to disabling an independent science uh, scientific community because it doesn't fit their political interests and their identity. So getting from here to there from the present political system is, poss is quite possibly impossible. But that's where you want to go. Very interesting. I, I wondered, in fact, whether if, if you had gone deeper in, into thinking about the European models, whether their emphasis in certain nations on a high degree of public funded media 
makes a difference in terms of their whole overall media ecosystem? For sure with Germany. With Germany, what's absolutely okay. clear is that the reason the IFD hasn't made inroads is because there's universal trust of the major public media. Yeah, that's what I that's what I thought. And 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 Germany more so than France. And we'll see what happens with Britain um, and, and the BBC. The reason I brought up the regulation of the broadcasters in particular was having sort of lived through the arc um, inside television, if you will, and watch the interest demands lifted from broadcasters. Um, it does suggest that when you put them back on, you might get the broadcast version of the benign family owner. That is, there's a reason for them to do news at, as a loss leader. I suspect that's not the case, but listening to you, I also suspect you do not believe there really are any changes other than the promotion of the public good and public media model. So I think uh, um, uh, you'll remember as well as I do how um, complicated the public interest obligations were, how varied they were. Um, let's not forget that public interest obligations to carry religious broadcasting once the FCC in 1960 allowed um, uh, broadcasters to get paid for that and still market against their public interest. Evangelicals bought the time away from all of the mainline Protestants and that was the beginning of televangelism, which is the beginning of Fox News. Uh, so, so it's not easy to have a fully private finance profit driven system with a layer of behavioral obligations as opposed to a structurally differently financed and governed public sector, and then allow for a private sector. We're back to the public option idea. If you look at Ann Allstott and Ganesh Sitaraman's book, that's the basic idea. You want a public option. It's not gonna help with people who are, we're out of the world in which anybody can sit back and say, and that's the way it is, folks. That's just not coming back. But at a bare minimum, a sustained, powerful public option. Now, again, you come back to PBS and NPR, and they're understood in American, in the American situation, as highly political. NPR readers and New York Times readers are basically on the left of the American uh, 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 polity. It's not that <laughs> history progresses and 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 habits change, but I think there's a real tension between depending on commercial media, even with behavioral regulation. And assuming that what you're getting- regulation has got First Amendment problems that, that are just so shocking and striking. Um, I, I, I'm glad you articulated all of the, 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 the many reasons why that's probably not the direction to go. Um, my fear and the note I wrote to myself about one of your conclusions was that it was so dystopian that that I I I, I wondered so doomsday, um, and that concerns me. Is that if we have to make the kind of changes you're talking about, we can't get from here to there. Uh, let's start by seeing what happens Tuesday. Uh, I think the American democracy is uh, at a transition point. I think there are substantive voter suppression efforts seeking to prevent what in any event, even with full participation would have been a minority, even with voter suppression will end up being a minority role. Um, I think that what we've seen from the attorney general, what we've seen from ICE, what we've seen uh, uh, from the Secretary of State. Uh, this is not about one willful man. So yes, I think that as part of a basic battle over the nature of American democracy and how it will work, media policy and media structures will be part of the story, but we're not going to get there without uh, a real political transformation starting um, with the election of 2020.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Jack. Yochai, this was a wonderful and wide ranging conversation. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to get a chance to hang out again. Thank you.